Hello, this is Mark Baer. Welcome to Conversations and Collaborations. I'm with a very longtime friend from back in the day and back in the day before that day, <laughs> Doug Blake. Let's jump right in. And I, I think as, uh, uh, as, as, a, as a starting place, let's just start with, with the sessions. Okay. And uh, explain that and we'll go from there. Well, you know, I've been working in the movie and television uh, business for quite some time, or as my family would say, I've never had a real job, so uh, starting when I was 17 years old. And at a certain point, about uh, as of five or ten years ago, I became fairly adept at it and was hired on a pr pretty particularly consistent basis. My friend Steve Nemeth sent me a script, and there was a phone number on it of the director named Ben Lewin. And uh, I remember I'm sitting in the lobby of a hotel in New York, and I read the script. And I call Ben, and I say, uh, I'm going to break my main rule. And he says, what's your main, main rule? And I go, well, I uh, give advice for free, but if you want me to work, you have to pay me. So I uh, said, I'm breaking that rule because this script is so good, and I want to be part of it. So I'll be back in Los Angeles in a week or so, and we're going to start working on this, and we're going to make this movie. And uh, literally, some, a little bit less than a year later, we were shooting the movie because I wasn't about to stop uh, until that happened, and it did. And about two years later, it's being nominated for an Academy Award. Right. It won, it won the Audience Award at Sundance and a special jury prize. It got an Academy Award nomination. It won Spirit Awards. I think all in all, it's won somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 or 30 awards over, the, over that, that year. And, uh, and then when it sold, it sold to Fox. The, f the day it was, the day that it screened, which was a Monday at noon, so therefore the screening was over somewhere a few minutes before two, and my phone and Steven's phone, all of our phones were starting to blow up, and by seven o'clock that night, it had been sold to uh, 20th Century Fox and their division, Fox Searchlight, for, to this day, still the highest price in terms of investment to return, in terms of the cost of the movie, and what it was sold for, the highest price ever paid at Sundance for a film. So that was a pretty good day. For the, for the audience that's watching this, maybe you get a, a quick synopsis of what we're talking about. Okay, this is a movie about um, love and sex and relationships and uh, uh, how one can overcome odds. It's, a, it's a tr based on a true story about a young man named uh, uh, Mark O'Brien, who at 36 years old, uh, he had been diagnosed with polio when he was five or six. By this time, he only had movement from the neck up. Um, he was a practicing Catholic. He had uh, gotten his degree from uh, Berkeley and uh, was a working journalist. And so uh, at 36 years old, he decided uh, he wanted to lose his virginity. And being a Catholic male who wasn't married, there was a relationship between him and his priest who was, ended up being played by Bill Macy. And uh, it's, as we say, it's the, I mean, if you tell that story, that doesn't sound like a comedy, but yet it's very funny and very real, and it talks about sex the way people actually have sex, and it talks about falling in love and relationships the way people actually do. And we always thought it's because it takes place in the corner, you know, with the cripples, you know, so we could talk about this stuff in a way that you can't in a in a normal rom com. It would just be just it just wouldn't happen. So that was one of the reasons why uh, I was so attracted to it. I mean, this is a real movie, and you know, I went to film school and I always wanted to make real movies. And that gets right back to the story that you just asked me about. I'm sitting in this theater, 1,200 people. The reason they the 1,200 people were there wasn't because there was any buzz. There was no buzz for the movie. Nobody had seen it, so nobody knew anything. But uh, it did have Helen Hunt, uh, John Hawks, and Bill Macy, all of whom were Academy Award nominees. And Helen Hunt had already won an Academy Award as Best Actress a few years before. So the lights went down, and the movie started. And about seven or eight minutes into the movie, I started to cry. And I'm not much of a crier, but I realized that that thing that you hear about, which is an audience falling in love with a movie, it was actually happening to a movie that I had a significant amount of work. Uh, in other words, that movie is as good as it is, 
partly because of the work that I put in it. You know, Now, that's not to say that somebody else couldn't have done that work, but I was the one who did that work. And like I said, I just started to cry. And then at the end, you know, standing ovation, a second standing ovation, a third standing ovation. I mean, it was quite the most remarkable thing uh, imaginable. So I say that to people uh, because we called ourselves the Alta Cocker Crew, which is Yiddish for, I mean, Sundance is supposed to be the discovery of 23-year-olds, you know, in this case, every single person who worked on that film was in their 50s or 60s. The director was already on Social Security, and yet, you know, here we were, the toast of Sundance. So, you know, what do they say? 25 years later, an overnight success. First of all, let, before I move on here, I want to kind of talk about the things that I knew that you did in it that maybe <laughs> nobody else would have known. But what it is is you, you were working on a very tight budget, mm -hmm. and your job was to make no money look like a ton of money. Because right. in the movie business, nobody cares if what your budget is. They expect $100 million on the screen. Right. It Every doesn't matter if you have $2 million, They want $100 million. Well, they say everybody pays the same price to go see a movie. It doesn't matter how much the movie costs. Right, so but, absolutely. But, but, but that movie has to look like it costs. Well, not just the look of it, the feel of the making of it. Yeah. So this was the one where, like I said, having been doing this for a couple of decades, this is the one I used up all my favors. We had all of the what you know the stuff that's on the other side of the camera that most people don't realize. We had all of the trailers. We had all of the great catering. We had the you know uh, we had Teamsters. We had uh, a union crew, all of whom were working non-union because I was able to you know go to the union bosses and say uh, you know this is the one. This is the favor. This is the movie that we're going to do. And do you want to come after? us who are making this wonderful movie and they went all right we'll get you the next time and so you know that was like you said uh, part and parcel of and it and then the look with what's i mean little detail that sticks out is in the, the apartment the the robbie canal artwork right you, you know it, you could put up anything but you right. didn't right you know because the, the we, re we knew robbie we called we said can we use your uh piece in the piece and you know and he went yeah sure you know and so it it all it all matters. This is stuff that nobody in the world would notice, but everybody feels. It's, it's right. part of the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the it's part of the feel. And then the other piece that I particularly, uh, and, and I, I saw it with a wonderful audience here with you at the Carmel Film Festival, right. opening night at the Carmel Film Festival, and uh, a, a woman with a, a, a child with disability stood up and spoke afterwards. I mean, th this makes me cry. Right. And, and, and and, and thanking you. And, you know, how often do you see an audience move right. that's, you know, that was a real, we want to be inspired. You know, we want right. to be, you know, as artists, we want art that makes us want to make better art. You know, and it's hard. What do you see that makes you want to, you know, it's, it's easy to push the buttons. It's easy, you know, you, you know how to but. do the technical thing. But to do something that, that, that makes people that knocks you back, right. and that makes you want to go out and and make a movie against all odds. It's a crazy thing to do. Right. The stats are extraordinary. I mean, Sundance alone, somewhere between eight and 10,000 movies are submitted to Sundance. Somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 100 or 125 are shown. 20 are in competition. Three get sold. That's the, the independent, that's the numbers, the raw numbers of the independent film world. It's just so hard to make a movie, and it's so it's it's so crazy to make a movie. Even not not only hard because you you love it, so you do it, but it's crazy to make a movie. But with with but it's important because again, it, it's important to the viewer who this touches. But it's important to the other artists to have the bar raised, and and, and that's where I want to take this conversation. But one of the things that I loved about this movie, what uh, you know, that I look for in any kind of piece of art that I want to do and how it, how it personally inspired me is it's so hard to hit the last note. Right. And the, and because it doesn't, the movie doesn't work until the last note is struck. Right. At 90%, it's easy to start to get tired. And yeah. it's that last 10% that makes the difference between yeah. something being good 
and something being and, great. And, and, and just the way the script worked, the way the piece worked, and, and how it came with the, just the, the last, it's just the last note of the piece in, in the movie that, you, that, that, that floored you. And, and I don't have that experience very often. But once you have that experience right. as, as an artist, you know, I'm just talking in terms of just craft. You, you, you've got you've to gotta aim high. You've got to know. You, you've got to reach to greatness to do this stuff. And you've got to see greatness to, to get up in the morning and do any, any creative thing. And the greatness of that last note, you know, this is why we did this. This is why we want to do this. This is why we want to make that jump. Right. And it, it was really something. So let's now talk about um, the uh, lecture you heard at, at uh, was it LACMA? Let's talk about that artist and, that, and what art is about. It was uh, somebody I'd known uh, most of my life. And, you know, you, you like his work and you know him as a person, but you don't really think about how somebody... Uh, approaches their process. His name's Tony Friedkin, yes, Anthony yes. Friedkin. Yes. So I just, you know, I'd seen he was going to give this lecture. I showed up. And it was really quite inspiring because uh, as beautiful as his work is, you don't always know that there is, in fact, a complete and total uh, backstory. I mean, he thinks about what he's doing. He thinks about why he's doing it. He thinks about what it is he's trying to accomplish. And then he goes out and does it. And that, and he's certainly not the only artist I know who thinks of things in a very profound way, you know, as as blithe as people can be about their about their work. The truth is, the really good people, in my opinion, know exactly what they're doing and they know why they're doing it. And he was really looking for an importance and a depth and a spirituality right. in this, uh, which I, you, you know, which I I think is in the air, you know, I I, I think that because. The conversation that 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 you we had about that, and the right. and the conversations that I've been having with other people, it, it seems that there's people really. It, it seems like there's a kind of a moment where that we're in, where reality gets so um, you know hard to reality gets a little gooey and uncertain. And where the media image is stronger than the underlying substantive art, you know, substantive thing going, where the artist becomes important again to kind of clarify, uh, you know, and uh, I, I feel we're kind of in that point. And anyway, at that point, hi, I'm Mark Baer. You're watching Conversations and Collaborations. I'm with Doug Blake. We'll be right back. You are watching Conversations and Collaborations. For all episodes, go to markdavidbear.com. I'm Mark Bear. This is Conversations and Collaborations. I'm with Doug Blake, a longtime, longtime friend, uh, filmmaker. Okay. Well, another interesting thing about when we were prepping the sessions before we were shooting it, and that was, at a certain point, what I like to say is, try and stop us from making this movie. And in this case, we had raised a certain amount of money, not a lot, 15 or 20 percent of the total budget. And it occurred to me that we still didn't have a, a, a really detailed budget. I really didn't know how much money and how uh, what I call the overall production design was going to happen. So with the director's permission, because it was a friend of his, somebody he had grown up with, I called, made a call to Australia, and I said, so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to take $25,000, and I'm going to start the process. As I say, the bus is going to leave the station. And with that $25,000, because this was a complicated situation in terms of underlying rights, because it's based on a true story, and that there were, there were people that the movie was about, we had to get their rights, and everybody was okay with doing it. But still, so I had to hire a lawyer to do the life rights issues. I hired an assistant director to help me put together a schedule. I hired a, uh, um, a production designer to help me figure out what it was going to cost in terms of the entire art department and the locations and all that sort of thing. And that was just a month's work. But at the end of that month, I had a real specific plan as to how the sessions was going to get mounted, how it was going to get made. And that, in a weird way, made it a lot easier. And then, of course, Coincidentally, 
uh, a talent agency, CAA, became involved and they loved the project and they helped cast it. And then all of a sudden, you know, boop, 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 literally within three months of me starting this process, then we had a start date and then we were going to make the movie. So it's just such once in a lifetime thing. And it's and, and like you say, that moment that you picked out where it's it's working, that's all you get. Yeah. That's it. That's that, that that's it. But geez. And even then you don't know if the magic's gonna happen. All my job is in the abstract is I create a space for magic to happen in. Yeah. And sometimes the magic happens and sometimes it doesn't. You know, even how I've often worked, does it matter? Very rarely does it happen. Of course, like yeah. like the stats that I said before. You're always threading the needle. You're o and then and then you've got to go find that needle in a haystack. So uh, to mix metaphors, but uh, there you have it. You, you know, that's what you you know you live for those moments. You live because you go, okay, I, I this is what I want to do. I can't always do things just for money. Not when you care about the art. It's or, it's, it's it's too hard and in. I think anybody that's been making movies, they start out would be gladly do it for nothing. Right. Y you know. You, right. But you, as, you you, get older, as you get older, you end you, up uh, with responsibilities right, yeah. of one sort but, or another. But that that love, no, no one gets into this if the love isn't there to start no. with. There's a lot easier ways to make a living than this. That's for sure. But to to but, to, to, to have that love come back. What do they call it? I mean, it's always the artist's way. It's always the warrior's way. Yeah. It's always the thing. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. Yeah, and uh, and knowing that that magic can be made, I was just really happy to be in that audience. That was just you know, <laughs> and and I took that, you know, as I, I've told Men Nemeth many times. Um, just uh, I was so happy to be part of it. Just seeing my friends, you know, it was it was like it was like one for the. For our whole tribe that we've right. grown up with, right. you know, I, I felt it justified our whole, <laughs> <laughs> our whole otherly not necessarily justifiable uh, group right. of friends. Well, like I said, when when I had that moment, uh, you know, of tears at the at that first screening, that was actually the thought that went through my head. Well, at least this time I hit it out of the park. You know, at least this time everything worked, and you know, and isn't that just the most beautiful thing? It's funny one does create for the, you know, one creates for oneself, one creates for the audience, but one creates for the tribe, you know, and we've, you know, over all these many years, we've known a lot of really talented people, Right. you know, we've, we've known a lot of great, great people, some who are famous, some that will never be known, Right. Uh, but it's all part of the same Right, it's all part of the same team. The and goo. <laughs> yeah, and that's uh, and I really that really crossed my mind that night when I, I I saw that. I was like, wow, this is something we're you know our team did it. You know, it, right. it, 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 it was it was something. You know, I was taking a little extra credit just for being in the audience. So our, our conversations now are about uh, niche television. What right. the what the what the uh, what the uh, future holds, what the possibilities are for uh, um, us. <laughs> and uh, again, you're about to, uh, you're stepping into a new kind of line of, uh, right, but, of work. But, right, but I had just finished uh, a, a series, uh, what five years ago was called a web series. Now, uh, I guess it's all in the cloud. Yeah. So I did it for a well-known uh, company for Imagine Television. Yeah. I was offered this job uh, doing this uh uh, six uh, episode uh, television series. I think of it as a TV series um, for uh, uh, a uh, online streaming service called Vimeo. They have a uh, an on uh, an on demand service, uh, a pay per view type situation. So I did it uh, because I wanted to see. Uh, what, you know, I mean, it was time to learn about that. And now it looks like that there'll be more of that uh, in the, my what's future. The, what's the name of the? Oh, it's called the parallax theory. Yeah, people, people. Like, yeah. Okay, it's parallax theory. It was an interesting uh, concept. There was a, a, a director who was a sort of a YouTube sensation. He has a couple million followers on YouTube, but he was one of the few who wasn't all that interested in being a star himself, though he had sort of inadvertently become one. So in this case, it was his idea to write this piece, and uh, and then he came to me out of all the people in the world that he could have come to to help him and to learn traditional filmmaking because he had never 
like most of these YouTube people, had never worked with a crew more than three or four people. And all of a sudden, he had a lot more money to spend. And at the end of the day, it was supposed to look and feel like a movie. Well, that is something that I pretty much know how to how to do. In fact, my, my joke is, if someone always asks me when I'm interviewing for a job that I'm supposed to think outside of the box, then my tendency is to get up and leave because it took us 125 years to build this box. I love this box. I'm really good inside this box. I'm not quite sure there is another box. I mean, the process of filmmaking has been essentially the same for 125 years. Now, you may have better toys. You may have quicker toys. You may have toys that can see light uh, further into the darkness and further into the bright light than you could of 100 years ago. But still, actors got to act. They have to have a script. There has to be, you know, if you want it to look like a film, you have to light it like a film. There are very few options in this world. And, you know, in editing, there are only, you know, seven or eight different ways to edit a story and uh, only seven or eight different ways to shoot a story. So, like I said, there may be other boxes out there, but this is the box I know. And now, as a result of that, there's a new television network that's starting that is going to be essentially uh, based on the idea that within five or ten years, there'll be no broadcast television, and in fact, there will be no cable television. Everything will be essentially an app, the way that now... I have HBO Go and Showtime On Demand and Crackle. These are apps, and on my and I have, uh, uh, you know, Apple TV, and you know, I hit my little button, and then I can go from my computer or from my smart TV and screen what it is that I want to screen just by going click, 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 and I can watch it anytime I want, and uh, and see whatever I want, and I can see it in high def. This is the future. So again, inside that future. There'll be some things that are being done for essentially no money, and there'll be things that are being done for a lot of money. And I believe that the filmmaking process is going to stay pretty similar, but the model in terms of cash flow, of how money comes back, that is going to evolve and that's going to change. So that's my short version of what I think the next future is going to be. Yeah, so I'm hoping for an art show. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, the point of it is yeah. there will be so much more niche uh, television because right. uh, the Bro only... Well, broadcasting and narrow casting are different animals, and it's the day of the direct, uh, you know, to your audience. Right, and by cutting out a lot of the middlemen, uh, more money can come back to uh, uh, to the individual filmmaker to allow them to make a living as well as to continue to make their art, or if they choose to call it that. And uh, so we'll just sort of have to see as these things emerge. Even as it is growing up, there were only the, originally there were three broadcast networks, and then there was Fox, and then there was CNN, and so on and so on, and now there's 500. Well now, uh, I think within 10 years, it'll be more like 5,000. And the question is going to be, how do you break through? How do you, you know, even as it is, like last night, I'm sitting there uh, with the dish going, how can I see the show that I want? I have to, like, scroll through 400 channels to find the channel that I knew that I wanted to see because I didn't know how to, you know, call up the channel I wanted. I'm sure, you know, every 12-year-old knows how to do this. I just am not one of those people who can do that. <laughs> the, the other thing that we're both uh, interested in is a documentary film, and uh, so uh, the the, uh, the Robert Williams film. Let's right. let's, let's uh, which is uh, also uh, uh, something that inspired me a, a, a great deal. Well, I've been collecting uh, Robert's work. I was a big fan of his work. Okay, Williams. Robert uh, Williams is a uh, long time. He was he's considered sort of like the grandfather of of a movement that's called pop surrealism. He started off in the in the 60s, he was one of the artists of Zap Comics. And uh, then during the punk era, he started doing album covers. The most famous one is uh, they licensed, uh, uh, Guns N' Roses licensed an image of his, uh, the girl with the spike in the arm, uh, for Appetite for Destruction. Uh, over the years, he's become well-known and, uh, and more expensive in terms of his artwork. But he also started a magazine called Juxtapose with a few other people, that was sort of the, uh, uh, I don't know, it, it was the documentation of this new movement, this pop surrealism. 
and now Juxtapose is one of the uh, biggest selling art magazines in the world. And so being familiar with him, I mean, nobody makes a documentary to make money. You know, it took almost 10 years to get this documentary made. Uh, and I've worked on other documentaries over the years. But if it's interesting and it keeps your artistic juices flowing, you just do it. Now, in this case, it was even more interesting to me because as far as I was concerned, the, the, the basic raison d'etre of the documentary was how do we talk about the creative process? I mean, people, you see movies and all of a sudden somebody is struck by inspiration and all of a sudden this wonderful painting uh, emerges. Well, most of the time, in my experience and my conversations with artists over the years, that's simply not how art is created. It's created uh, with a backstory. It's created with thought. It, there's usually an idea of what it is you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to say, and how you're trying to say it. And so I wanted to talk about that process. And for better or for worse, I, I hope that we approach that in Robert Williams' Mr. Bitchin, which was the name of the film uh, when it was finished. And it's been shown in lots of museums. And It's really know. good. Well, thank you. So just as a, as a last uh, place where I'm going to go today, your birthday party 30 years ago, 40, how many years ago at Bentley with uh, Jamie Cohen, Penelope Spears? The, right. You remember this night? And of that was course. just kind of a, I was just thinking back on our, how far right. back we go. I had Paul Schrader. There were a lot of, there were a lot of <laughs> Penelope Spears, like you said, there were a lot of people at that party that somehow I had managed to be part of my, my circle. So, yeah. Yeah, so that. And we've been, we've been hanging out ever since. And, uh, and here, here we are, uh, it's car week. That's We're right. Looking at the Shelbys. Still standing, yep. 50th anniversary of the, of the four GTs winning Le Mans, 50th anniversary of one of my cars, uh, you know, all that, you know, needless to say, happy to be in uh, Monterey uh, and always happy to be here for this week. There you go. And then I guess, uh, I guess we should put in a word for Baton Rouge. <laughs> Poor Baton Rouge is flooding this week. Right. Uh, and, uh, it just so happens I, I have a house in Baton Rouge. I moved back there a couple of years ago because of uh, uh, it was an easy place to make uh, movies. There was a very effective tax incentive uh, program there. And, um, a, 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 you know, as they say, a once in 500 year flood took place. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of over 30 inches of water of rain fell within a day and rivers overflowed, and uh, it wasn't a hurricane. It was, and so it took place in the north, which was not considered like a flood zone, but the rivers overflowed four and five feet, and all of a sudden the equivalent you know, of a tsunami, of a wave of water, and so many, many feet of water went through much of Baton Rouge and the environs, and you know, we're still, still digging out. Yeah, you're just hanging out in California until it dries a little yeah, bit. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this is Mark Baer. You're watching Conversations and Collaborations with Doug Blake. And that's all for today. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Conversations and Collaborations. For all episodes, go to markdavidbear.com. See it now. Don't wait. Mm -hmm.